Today's episode of the Believe in Steelers podcast is brought to you by betonline.ag and Ike coming off the Friday morning after Steelers loss on Thursday night football is a little bit tough, but we still have a lot of action in week 14 of the NFL season. If you want to place a bet on that NFL action, betonline.ag is the place to do it. Yes, that loss was tough, but to make things better, make sure everybody, if you do want to bet, make sure y'all go to betonline.ag. We'll go somewhere. To- Yes, I can head to the new and updated mobile website to sign up today to receive your 50% welcome bonus on your first deposit. Just use our promo code BELIEVE50, B-L-E-A-V-5-0 to receive your bonus. Bet online where the game starts. All right, cue the music. It's time to start the show. Welcome to the Believe in Steelers podcast on the Believe Podcast Network. I'm your host, Mark Bergen, joined as always by my guy, two-time Super Bowl champion and 12-year veteran of the Pittsburgh Steelers, number 24, Ike Taylor. Ike, we're recording this the Friday morning after a Steelers loss on Thursday night football to the Minnesota Vikings, final score 36 to 28. Steelers very nearly had the largest comeback in NFL history, but we're licking our wounds this morning coming off a loss. How are you doing this morning, my man? Man, I'm okay. Um, I saw some fight, not only from the coaching staff, I saw some fight from Big Ben. I saw some fight from Minka Fitzpatrick. So uh, it was a good game, a great game to watch. Like you say, down 29-0, had opportunities to come back and tie the game, man. But that's that's what I wanted to see. I wanted to see some fight, and they fought last night. I, I'm going to put this caveat in there before we get into the discussion. We have an absolutely loaded show. I want to see that fight in the first half, not putting up any points. You're down 23-0 at halftime, and it was just too big of a deficit. I loved what I saw in the second half with that team, but I'd like to see that urgency earlier on in the game, maybe go to the hurry up and mix that into the offense earlier than you saw when it was a do-or-die scenario. But it came down to the final play. The final play is going to be on our Taylor Talk segment later in today's show, though. But again, I just point to facing a 29-point deficit. Steelers very nearly had the largest comeback in NFL history. That is a 28-point deficit. Steelers very nearly tied it up. They would have needed a two-point conversion had they scored on the final play. But you've got to have that same urgency from the get-go, from kickoff, and the Steelers did not do that last night. Sometimes, Mark, the ball just don't bounce your way. So, you know, I, I get I, I didn't been a part of them kind of games. You know what I'm saying? Like, we started off slow. And then the second half, we kind of took off and the momentum came our way. I felt the same way about Pittsburgh last night. When it was 29-0, to zero, I was like, man, Pittsburgh can't do nothing right in the first half. Um, what I do know about uh, Minnesota Vikings offense is they've been playing pretty good. But once you get it, once you stop Dalvin Cook and put it on uh, old Captain Kirk, man, it's going to be a game that you probably have a chance to come back and win. So that's, that's how I thought about it. But 29 29- 29 to, to, to zero at halftime. I was telling people, I said, man, they got a whole other half of football. And it was laughing at me, but it was all good. But I did like the fight from the Pittsburgh Steelers. Yeah, I was hoping that Bashad Breeland clip of him on the sideline trying to figure out why the Steelers had come back. I was hoping they would come back because that would have been the ultimate gift of all time. Steelers fall just short. And Ike, this was a crucial game for Pittsburgh's playoff push. But I want to get into a few coaching decisions here. And I'm going to start with this. This is a show where we are fans of Mike Tomlin and the Steelers coaching staff. But there were some questionable decisions in last night's game. And for me, do you want to start with the decision making or what happened with Chase Claypool, Ike? Because we're not doing our job effectively on this show if we're not calling it how we see it. Where would you like to start? Would you like to start the decision-making or Chase Claypool? Because I really want to get into this. So we can start off with Chase Claypool. So and, and, yeah. and before before we even got on the show, you gave me the rundown, Mark, on what we was going to talk about. 
and I said Chase Claypool, and you said Chase Claypool, damn that at the same time. And what, what we, <clears throat> excuse me, what we saw from Chase Claypool last night was some immaturity. You know what I'm saying? Some, uh, some. Okay, man, my bad. I'm sorry. It won't happen no more. We saw some man. It's 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 24 seconds left. Trying to score. You want to get up and stand a rush and hand the ball to the referee. You want to get up and you want to do the smell. It's the immaturity. That's the immaturity part, man. That's that's a couple of weeks ago we talked about, and he was trying to make a case of playing music in practice. It's the immaturity, man. It's the it's the you can just hear from 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 Big Ben. He was like, Psh, man, the sky's the limit for this for this receiver Chase Claypool. Only if he can get his mind right. It's the immaturity, man. Stop yeah, being- I, let me let me piggyback off this really quickly too. It's his eighth penalty of the season early in the game. No other NFL wide receiver has more than five. Eighty-three yards penalized this season. No other NFL receiver has more than forty-five. And at the end of the game, you're talking about the Steelers' final drive. They've got the ball. Forty-one seconds left. Minnesota forty-three yard line. You go down, and he cost the Steelers at least five seconds. And the final play to Fryermuth, which we're going to break down. Maybe you get another shot at it if you rush to the line, get to the line of scrimmage, get the ball set to, so you can snap it and spike it. The clock is not your friend at that point in the game. Understand the down distance and scenario of the game. I'm not saying Chase Claypool cost the Steelers the game, but he cost them a chance at potentially being able to run another play. And that late in the game and, and with the penalties that we've seen, he very nearly fumbled it. If not, his knee was down, but he was trying to stretch to make a play. The sky is the limit for Chase Claypool. We saw that a season ago when he scores 11 touchdowns as a rookie, which ties a Steelers franchise rookie record. But when I see when you're costing your team a chance to potentially win the football game, I've got to say something. And this is where I miss Juju Smith-Schuster, Ike, because – This is a scenario where if you had the receiver depth, you could sit Chase Claypool and put him on the bench and make him think about what he needs to do to help the football team win games. And you can't do that right now because you don't have the receiver depth. Juju's not healthy. And so, yeah, there are other players on the roster, but Chase Claypool is going to be by far the most talented Steelers receiver outside of Deontay Johnson. Yeah, this is tough, man. Um, I mean, then he got pissed off at his teammate who understood what was going on in the game and understood they didn't have any timeouts left. So, bro, hurry up. Let me take this ball and give it to the referee. And he gets mad at his teammate. He gets the power at his teammate. Like, bro, that immaturity stuff got to go, man. Too, too, we're too professional for that. You got to understand, this, this is not college, man. This lies on the line. And, and you're blessed and you're fortunate to be able to play. Um, you're one of the few, which is it's 1,500 guys in the world that play in the NFL. 1,500 in the world. You're one of the few, bro. Over 100 some thousand kids play college football between Division One, Two, and Three. That's a that's a that's a that's a lot of people, man. Only only 40, what 48 wide receivers who start in the NFL. Man, you're different. And I'm talking to Chase Claypool. Like, you all are way different. But, bro, you got to get some maturity, bro. You have I'm to. With you. I'm with you, Ike. I'm with you, Ike. And I go to the second last play of the game where Deontay Johnson catches a crossing route. He's able to make Patrick Peterson miss and get out of bounds. I think we, you're going to hear discussion today about this Thursday night football game. You would hear even more discussion if Johnson would not have been able to get out of bounds and make Peterson miss about Chase Claypool wasting precious, valuable time in this game by celebrating a first down when you've got less than a minute to play and you need every second you can get. And I can't help but wonder if the Steelers get two shots at the end zone at the end versus just one. Are we talking potentially about a different outcome? Now, I also want to go into the decision-making too, Ike. Down 16, Steelers have the football in the fourth quarter, and they decide to run the ball three plays in a row. What, what are we doing here? Like, 
again, I am a fan of Mike Tomlin and this coaching staff, but that decision-making down two scores with time ticking down is at the very least questionable. Yeah, you know, I kind of question that as well, um, especially going against the clock. You know what I'm saying? So, but it almost worked out. But like you say, sometimes I just don't know what these coaches would be thinking. You know, so it's it's kind of hard in the heat of the moment. I've coached. I've never coached on a professional level. But, hell, I did coach for four years and understood what pressure was. And it wasn't nothing for me because I always try to think a player ahead. Some coaches just get caught in that play and they're not thinking two or three play, plays ahead. So I thought you was talking about also when it was 20 to 29, they went for that two-point conversion. I'm like, bro, just get the one piece. Yeah, yep. well, you don't. You don't have to correct me if I'm wrong. You felt the same way? Yes, sir. Because it, I, for me, it's as simple as this. If you take the extra point and make it, it's now a one score game. Yes, you need a touchdown and a two point conversion. If you don't convert, I understand you say, well, we now know what we need to do. We're down two possessions. But you go from if you take the extra point, it's a one possession game. They fail to convert the two point conversion on a screen pass to Deontay Johnson. That made it a two-possession game, trailing by nine points at that point in the game, at that point in the fourth quarter. I am 100% with you, Ike, for that reason. Yeah, I, I just that, – that kind of confused me. So, you know, like, like you just said, the one piece is better than the no piece, and they got nothing when they try to go for that two-point conversion. I thought kicking that field goal would have been good. You like the way I said that, right, Mark? <laughs> The one piece. Yes, I did. Yes, I did. I guess I did. <laughs> I tell you what, too, before we get to Taylor talk here too. that final drive by the Steelers and Big Ben lead the team down and Chase Claypool did draw a pass interference penalty. I thought right. we were going to we were going to be talking about the Jordan Berry revenge game because it was an excellent punt by the Vikings punter, former Steelers right. punter. And on the very first play of the Steelers final drive. Najee Harris had a catch along the sidelines. It might have gone for five yards. It didn't go for the full 10. And at least moved the Steelers in a positive direction moving forward. And what I've seen from Najee Harris is the reason why he's an every down running back is he's a load to bring down. He has excellent hands out of the backfield, and he's an effective blocker, Ike. And we're going to see that now. We'll move to Taylor Talk. On the final play of the game, this this footage courtesy of NFL Game Pass, Ike. Last play of the game, Big Ben trying to find rookie tight end Pat Fryermuth. But look at this play. The Vikings bring five pass rushers against the Steelers and watch the blitz pickup of Najee Harris off Big Ben's left hip on this play. But I want to turn things over to you now, Ike Taylor. What did you see on this play? Um, The fact that you're saying Najee uh, pass protect, uh, tells me you you watching a lot of good football and you know football because usually your typical fan don't know that part on um, pass blocking and seeing how important that is. That's the second time you brought brought that up about Najee uh, pass blocking at crucial times in the game. So that's good eyes on you. Now this play is from a perfect position. Um, of course, this is the play that Fairmuth had dropped the ball, but at the same time, if y'all can just look and I've talked I've talked about Ben. I expressed how I felt about Ben. Um, this year, but I tell you what, when it was time to come back and give your team opportunity against the Vikings to come back last year, that's exactly what Big Ben did. Um, we're going to break down this this was supposed to be touchdown, but we're going we're going to really concentrate on Big Ben man because Big Ben dropped he dropped this ball where nobody else can drop this ball at and give the Pittsburgh Steelers an opportunity to try to win the ball game. But it's it's trips right. What I mean by trips right, fans and viewers, if y'all listening, if you're in Big Ben, if you're in Big Ben position, you got three receivers to the right. As you can see, you can see Fairmouth and Claypool next to each other. Wide out is Devontae Johnson, and on the left hand side by himself is James Washington. So, can we run this play? Pause it. So. Big Ben already know where he's going. So with the with the Vikings doing, they're showing a two-shell look. A two-shell look is two safeties sitting on top so nothing gets deep on either one of the hashes, and they're playing underneath. So man underneath is 
when you see two safeties high man underneath, if somebody says that, you just understand that they're playing everything underneath the 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 wide receivers. So um, they have they got they have to protect the inside and make everything go outside. And the reason why you protect the inside because you make one of these throws hard. Now, if you look up top where Faramuth is at, the tight end he ran like a post seam. So he ran the post seam. As you can see, you, they have the triangle on Fairmont. Fairmont. So you got the two safeties sitting at the top, and you got the linebacker underneath. And this ball has to be perfect. Can we run the tape? Yeah, look how tight this window Big Ben threads the needle. We're going to pause it again here, Ike. I mean, we was watching him before the show, and all I kept saying was, oh, my gosh. <laughs> he, he threw it when he wasn't even breaking yet. He threw it at a spot. Now, now we understand between clutch games between uh, Big Ben and Fairmont, why they're always on the same page, why they're always looking for each other in these kind of moments. Because, man, Ben dropped this ball, and he understood Fairmont was going to be in the place where he needed to be to have an opportunity to catch this ball. But if you just look at the, the triangle that was wide at first, now it closed in, and if you could just run the tape, Seven plays that ball where nobody else can place this ball. And you can see it right here. I mean, and they say it's a game of inches. If Harrison, number 22 for the Vikings, didn't come over there and punch that ball out as soon as he caught it, it might have been something different because I feel like he had an opportunity. If he would have got hit by the corner right here by Alexander, if he would have got hit, he would have been able to shield it. If it wasn't for Harrison, but... We always talk, man, game of inches, and seven couldn't put this ball in a better spot. I, what I wanted to ask you about as a fellow defensive back, Harrison, the Viking safety, knocks the ball out. He's a five-time pro bowler. But what I right. wanted to ask you was, on this play, what is the difference as a defensive back if you hit the ball down against a opposing receiver versus if he would have tried to jar the ball loose by punching up? Oh, that's that would have been that would have been tough to do. What, what Harrison just did to to knock that ball out, it was perfect timing. As soon as he got his left foot down on the ground, Fairmont got his left foot down on the ground. He already knew Harrison already knew somebody was gonna come in and hit the ball. So let me get an opportunity to punch it. And he he placed and punched and hit it at the perfect time. And I, I'm happy that Big Ben at least threw the ball into the end zone because I know the two outside receivers, Deontay Johnson and James Washington, are just running fade routes. Harder to complete the outside pass, but then in the slot, Chase Claypool runs what's called an X route where he fakes the slant but then pivots back outside Throwing the ball underneath, if he throws to Claypool in that scenario, and you can see that from this view here, I don't know. I think the defenders converge on Claypool, and he doesn't have enough space to get into the end zone. So I credit Big Ben here. He, even though this ball wasn't completed, he threw it in the perfect window and at least gave the Steelers a chance on the final play of the game. Now, had they scored, they'd have also needed a two-point conversion to tie the game. But considering that you had a 29-point deficit and it came down to the final play, I think says a lot about the Steelers' determination in coming back in this game. One other thing I want to say, too. I want to erase this narrative immediately of saying, well, Pat Fryermuth might not be a clutch player considering he also had a fumble in the Detroit Lions tie earlier this season. He's as sure-handed as they come. He leads NFL tight end rookies with touchdowns with six, 43 catches on 57 targets. This would have been a Pro Bowl, all-pro caliber play, a play I might expect him to make later in his career. He's going to take it hard. He's going to try to come back and get better. I, I want to erase any doubts to say, oh, Frymuth's not a clutch player because it, I, I would have either wanted the ball to go to him or I'd have wanted the ball, maybe a jump ball to chase Claypool in the end zone. You're two big targets. And again, at least the Steelers had a chance on the final play, especially considering the deficit they faced earlier in the game. Yeah, Frymuth, he all the way good in my book. He's still a baby. You know what I'm saying? I don't know why people, if they got something to say, say something about him. He's still a baby. You just broke down the stats, Mark. You said the man has six touchdowns. He's leading all the tight ends with the touchdowns as a rookie. Like, 
what, what, what he can't do. You know what I'm saying? The man block. That's the first thing Coach Tomlin yeah. asked. You know, he, he fired him with he's a hell of a tight end, and this is in in, in training camp. And Coach T said, "I know he can catch. I want to see if he can block." Like, and the man just he wind up getting on the field. He is T.J. Watt on the defensive side. Every time Big Ben go for a clutch guy, every time we need to play, guess where he go? He's just been Mr. Consistent. He, it's been fair one. So that's my T.J. Watt on the, on, on the opposite side. You know what I'm saying? Like, I feel like T.J. is that guy. But when fair move, when he gets down to that, when you need to play on the offensive side and we get in that red zone, this is the play right here. So I, I'm going I'm to give the young man the mulligan on this one. You know, because he's has been another consistent guy throughout the season for the Pittsburgh still as a rookie, though. You know, it's, it's hard to come in as a rookie, not only just get in the game sometimes, but hell, start. You know, now, now, they, now we haven't heard from Eric Ebro. You know what I'm yep. saying? Like In a he, contract he, year, too, I might add. He's the guy. This young man, I don't care about the drop. It was somebody, punch, Harrison punched the ball out. He got hit. I care more about the fight. That the Pittsburgh still the show in the second half. I'm not and worried about it. it. It's Fryermuth who scored a touchdown too to help the Steelers get back into position to mount a comeback. And I've got to give a shout out to the two interceptions, which really got the Steelers back into the game without those turnovers. I don't right. know what we're talking about. Ike, before we get to our ad read too, my final thought, I don't know how the Vikings entered this game five and seven, considering their offense can move the football. And so I know Dalvin Cook's missed some time with the shoulder injury. He's certainly a key piece to that Minnesota offense. But, like, they have way too much talent. I mean, think about this, too. Adam Thielen didn't even play last night either. So you add him into the mix for this Minnesota offense, too. I am surprised. I am very, very surprised. They came into this game with, what, a five and seven record. So it's just like, just considering what we saw, the way that they were able to control the line of scrimmage, I was very impressed by. And I, I'm surprised the Steelers even mounted a comeback because I, I thought we might be talking about a blowout on today's show. We'll go ahead and take a quick break. I, well, I, go ahead before we, we get to our ad read. Go ahead. No, you're good. You're good. Okay. We will go and we're going to take a quick break now to tell our listeners and viewers about Lightbox and Lightbox Diamonds. They use cutting edge technology and innovative techniques. They've cracked the science of the sparkle, Ike. It's the holiday season. You might be thinking about popping the question to that special someone or maybe getting that special someone in your life. Just some some new bling, as you like to say, Ike. So they've created the highest quality lab grown diamonds you can find at a light price of $800 per carat man if you're trying to get something for your girl your wife your mom your sisters man make sure y'all light it up at lightbox ike you're the best at these ad reads visit lightboxjewelry.com and sparkle add sparkle to your holiday shopping again that is lightboxjewelry.com lightbox diamonds never a dull moment ike we're going to take a little bit of a turn here and some sad news that we need to get to right. five-time pro bowl wide receiver Demarius Thomas died on Thursday night. He was found in his Georgia home. Uh, again, a five-time pro bowler really made his mark in the league on the Denver Broncos and played for several different teams in the league. But I really wanted to ask you about on this today's show, considering you were going up against Thomas for what was probably his most important moment as a professional, maybe outside of winning the Super Bowl. And so January the 8th, 2012, wild card round, Thomas caught the game winning 80 yard touchdown pass from Tim Tebow on the opening play to beat the Pittsburgh Steelers. And I, I was trying to think of the best way to ask you about this. I'm just going to go ahead and turn the floor over to you so you can provide a proper tribute to Demarius Thomas. Oh man, goddamn stud! Um, first round draft pick coming out of Georgia Tech um, was one of the reasons why Tim Tebow was successful. Uh, was a guy who's six three, two twenty, two twenty five. Can run a four three. Don't come around too often. Um, then you just hear some of my teammates who know guys off the Denver Broncos. Man, the dude ain't nothing but a good kid. Like, he's a kid at heart. And then you look at his story on what happened when he was 
you know, a child, you know, both of his parents going going to jail, like, and he had to be the man of the house at some point in time. But to die at 33 years old, man, you still a baby. You still a baby. Um, prayers and condolences to Demarius and his family. Coming from me, um, coming from you as well. But 33 years old, bro, it's, I mean, we talk about our age, Mark. You still a baby. You still you still got a lot of life, you think, left ahead of you. But Demarius as a football player, he was he was he was Megatron. He was Megatron little brother. Like he once he got the ball, you had to come with everything you had in your body, to try to get him down. Because, you know, that was just and I got that first hand in the wild card playoff game. Against him and Tim Tebow, you know, he, he gave me a mean little stiff on. And I was like, man, he out of here. He gone. He gone. But, yeah, man, prayers to the Marys, Thomas, and his family. 33, too young. Yeah, Ike, I'm with you. He would have been 34 on Christmas Day. So we're thinking about him and his family right now. Played for the Broncos, the Texans, the Patriots, and the Jets. Also won Super Bowl 50 alongside Peyton Manning. So, um, you know, again, thinking about him and his family at this time. Ike, we'll go ahead and go to our next segment. And this is brought to our viewers and listeners by our sponsor, Bet Online. And so we've got some odds for our viewers and listeners. I'm really excited about this. One of them, your prediction for who will be the Steelers starting quarterback in the 2022 season. You got Mason Rudolph, a draft pick, Big Ben coming back for another year, Dwayne Haskins, free agent signing, or a quarterback added via trade. I'll tell you what I'm thinking, but I want you to go first, Ike, of who could be the Steelers' starting quarterback of all the options I just listed off, who you got for next I'm season. Gonna, I'm going to go, as you said, I'm going to go with Aaron Rodgers. I'm going to go with right. Aaron um, I laughed at you earlier, but you you was you was you was spot on, Mark. You was spot on. So I'm gonna go with Aaron Rodgers. I think Aaron Rodgers next year, if they don't go deep into the playoffs um with the Packers this year, he won't go out on slide over to Pittsburgh. Like I appreciate you. And that those odds, a quarterback added via trade plus seven hundred, that is the biggest long shot. If Ooh. I'm a betting man, I here's what I do. Because I've said, I don't think Big Ben's heir is on this roster right now. I go ahead and bet on 100 bucks on the free agent signing to pay back 500 profit, so you'd get 600 back. I also go bet 100 bucks on quarterback added via free agent signing. That is plus 700, meaning you get 800 back, $700 profit. If I throw $200 on, that, on those two options, either a free agent signing or a trade, I'm coming out on the green either way in the end. So again, bet online. You can go do this. They have the odds there. That's what I'm thinking. I'm trying to get our viewers and listeners a little bit of cold, hard cash that will help them refinance maybe some Christmas presents that they'll pay for this time of year. Hey, Mark, you did that right now. I can't come behind that. You brought that thing down, man. Make sure y'all go to betonline.ag. But yeah, do what my podcast partner, Mark, just said. It's free money, Ike, in all honesty. So, okay, a few other odds we need to get to. And these odds were before the Thursday night football game, before TJ Watt left the game with an injury. But it would be about whether he would bite, break Michael Strahan's single-season sack record of 22 and a half sacks. You could bet the over or the under. Now, the over plus 200 going into tonight, uh, last night's game, the under of 22 and a half sacks, was minus 300. So that was very much favored. I would imagine that those odds will be even more for the under just because I don't know how much, I, I don't know if Watt is healthy, if the Steelers are going to continue to play him. If it's an absolutely crucial must-win game, I think he'll suit up. But he came into last night's game with 16 sacks and only 10 games played. If he were healthy, I think he could do it with the addition of one game as well, you go from a 16-game regular season to a 17-game regular season. But if he struggles to stay on the field, 
either take the under or just don't even bet on this. And I'd be surprised if this is even on the board considering the injury to Watt last night. Yeah, that's just that's the issue. Um, we need a whole full season from Watt, something we haven't had yet, you know, in a while. So, yeah, he, he's sitting on what, 16 sacks in 10 games? Oh, man. Six, 16 and 11 now because I don't think he had one last night. So if you were healthy, though, Ike, I think he'd have an honest shot at this record. He would have closed the game out for the Pittsburgh Steelers one. He would have made a play. He would have came around the corner. He would have closed the game out one or got the game started, got the momentum started. That's that's just what T.J. Watt do. That's what that's what he do. He, he, he Oh, you need a play guy? Oh, here come T.J. Watt. Every time you need a play. T.J. Watt is always making the play. And Ike, last odds that we have before we go to our week 14 picks. First coach fired, Bears head coach Matt Nagy, the odds on favorite. And I say take the favorite here for this reason. The Bears this weekend take on the Green Bay Packers, the NFL's old, longest and oldest rivalry. And it's just going to be yet another nail in the coffin, I think, at the season's end. And maybe it's not just Matt Nagy. I think the general manager, Ryan Pace, is on the hot seat in Chicago, too. Mike Zimmer, the Vikings coach, is second on that list, followed by Joe Judge of the New York Giants, Urban Meyer of the Jacksonville Jaguars, and Fanny Pack Vic Fangio of the Denver Broncos. I'm picking Nagy from this list, Ike. Anyone else that you think that might be out of a job come season's end? No, I I hate to say that, but yeah, I'm going to go with you with Nagy. Yeah. Yeah, me too. Well played, Ike. You're like, you know what? Let's move on. And we will to our week 14 picks. Well played, Ike Taylor. We're going to start Cowboys at Washington football team. NFC East matchup. Cowboys are four and a half point favorites, and I'm going to take them on the road. I know Washington's won four in a row, but the Cowboys are getting back Randy Gregory and Neville Gallimore on that defensive line. Give me the Cowboys, Ike. Who you got in this one? I'm going to go with the um, I'm going Taylor Heineken and Washington team. I'm going I, – I just – right now, I just like Taylor. I like the way he's playing. I like the way that defense is playing. That defense has been playing good without Chase Young as well, you know. But, yeah, I'm going to go I'm gonna go with Taylor Heineken and company. I love Gibson as a running back. Uh, McLaurin as a wide receiver, I think he's highly underrated. But, yeah, I just like – I just like the way they feed off of Taylor. Taylor, Taylor always do – he always do something. He always Ike, do something. Ike, you're an old school guy. You like the fact that the Washington football team has won back-to-back weeks of a final score of 17 to 15. I know you're old school, like Taylor. So I, I see. Don't act like I know. Don't know what you're doing. I see what you're doing, Ike. Get off my head. <laughs> Ike's like it's too early for this. All right, Ravens at Browns, a rematch of the AFC North teams rivals what have you and afc north it's like no one wants to just claim it outright brown's coming off a bye week they played the ravens in week 12 now the ravens are going to be without marlon humphrey their star corner right tackle patrick mccarry is going to be out for a few weeks too so add that to the long list of injuries that the ravens had i kind of like the browns to get some redemption in week 14 i like their running attack nick chubb cream hunt and the browns outside of the tight end position have been as healthy as they've been all season long give me cleveland at home against baltimore on sunday yeah i'm gonna go with that pick as well i'm gonna go with cleveland um i just think until lamar jackson and the offense figure out these blitzes the teams will continue until you pick it up whether it's protection wise or play wise they will continue to do that, and I think the Cleveland Brown have enough guys on the D line to get to Lamar and cause confusion. So yeah, um, I think this buy was very much needed for the Cleveland Browns and Baker Mayfield to get back healthy some sort. Uh, but yeah, I'm going. I'm going with the. I'm going with the Cleveland Browns. I just it's just now, you know. And you said that Marlon Humphreys, they just down bad. And what I mean by down bad, they got a lot of key starters who are not going to play. And this has been going on before training camp. Let's keep it in the AFC, Ike. We've got Raiders at Chiefs. Kansas City favored by nine and a half at home. The big question I have, does Raiders tight end Darren Waller play? He's. It, it appears he's going to miss his second straight game because he's got knee and back injuries. He sat out practice on Thursday. 
If he can't go, he's such a key piece to this Raiders offense, a Raiders team that has really kind of been in a tailspin after John Gruden's resignation and then after the team released Henry Ruggs after his arrest, uh, DUI crash and everything too. So I'm going to take the Chiefs at home. I like them to cover. Chiefs have been hot. The defense has played much better in recent weeks. Give me Kansas City at Arrowhead. The last six weeks um, between the New England Patriots, the Kansas City Chiefs, and the Miami Dolphins, we want to talk about defense, man. These boys have been top three of points allowed per game in defense, you know, the last six weeks. And that's what you want. You want your team to get hot later in the season. And that's what we've been asking for while, the, while we felt like the Kansas City Chiefs was losing was because of that defense and them giving no points. But now they didn't, they didn't tighten the rope up. So it's all the way good. Patrick Mahomes um, haven't been playing like Patrick Mahomes, but sooner or later he's going to get back hot. That's, I look at Patrick Mahomes like a stuffed curd. You know, let's shoot the shoot. You know, they, they, that's that's what they do. If they feel like in the slump, they're going to shoot it out. So I think eventually Patrick Mahomes going to get hot at the wrong time, at the right time for themselves, but it's going to be bad for a lot of other teams who they're going to play. So, yeah, I'm going KC. It is just too much up and down roller coaster right now in the season from the uh, Las Vegas Raiders. All right, Ike, a few more matchups we need to get through. We're up against the clock right now. So, Bills, Bucks, Bucks favored by three and a half at home. I don't like the way that the Bills are trending. I think they struggle to stop the run, but then I also think that they struggle to run the football themselves. Not a recipe that I like in December. I'm going to take the Bucks favored by three and a half. I'm going to take the Bucks as well. Okay, we'll go to 49ers at Bengals. Niners are a one and a half point favorite, still clinging on to that seven seed in the NFC, right at uh, 500 and record for the 49ers. Who you got between 49ers and Bengals? Cincinnati's at home if, in this one. If Debo Samuels plays this week, I'm taking the 49ers. If Debo Sam, Samuel don't play this week, I'm taking the Cincinnati Bengals. Well played, Ike Taylor. I'll take the Bengals at home to get to rebound. Two more matchups to get to. Bears and Packers, NFL's oldest rivalry. Green Bay fi- favored by 12 and a half. I'm taking Green Bay to win and to cover, Ike, because Justin Fields is going to be back from his rib injury. He's cleared yeah. to go. He'll play through some pain, but I think there might be some rust there getting back on the field. Green Bay is as good as they come in the NFC and Aaron Rodgers doubling down on his I own you comment saying he doesn't regret doing that. He is like the the heel, the villain in Chicago. This man is hated, sports hated, I mean. I, I'm, I'm taking Green Bay. It's like, I love how it's like, you know what? No, I don't regret it. I'm going to double down on what I said, and I'm going to continue to own you. Rodgers, a 22-5 and five record as a starter against the Bears. That includes the playoffs. Give me Green Bay by 12 and a half in this one. Yeah, I'm uh that's what I'm rocking with. Green Bay as well. It's just not a healthy. You know what I'm saying? Like they've been playing this well with a, a few guys who've been backups. And these guys has been getting nothing but starting reps in the NFL. So now when I go down to my uh down my, my roster, I'm looking at depth at a few positions. So yeah, I'm going with Aaron Rodgers. He do own, I'm sorry to say this, Mark, but he do own the Chicago Bears. Oh, I mean, he should. Like, I, I go back to what I said earlier this offseason. If you think Green Bay is in that, what are you going to say about Chicago, Detroit, and Minnesota? So there you go. The NFC North runs for, through Green Bay. That's that's well known. That's just facts. Monday Night Football, Rams at Cardinals, NFC West Showdown. And I, I'm going to take the Cardinals. I think they're real. I think they're legit. Favored by two and a half. But the Rams, 23rd in the league in rushing at 97.9 yards per game. I go back to, I can't help but think what this Rams team would be like if Cam Akers were healthy this season. Ultimately, I think that will hamstring this team. The Not the inability to run the football, but the fact that they struggle to run the football. I'm taking the Cardinals. I think they're legit. I think Kyler Murray's playing great football this season when he's been healthy. And I think Cliff Kingsbury might be the NFL coach of the year. Give me Arizona at home. I'm getting Arizona at home as well. I'm liking what Mighty Mouse is doing. And Mighty Mouse for me is K1. K1, if ain't no Mighty Mouse at K1, that's Kyler Murray. So that guy, he always gives them an opportunity to to just just as well, just as well as Lamar Jackson is doing for his team in Baltimore using his legs. Kyle Moore be doing the same thing, you know. So the, the fact with him, he just needs to stay healthy. But yeah, 
this this Cardinals defense, James Conner has become or revamped or turned into somebody totally different. You know, rushing the ball and scoring touchdowns. It's like he having fun over there in Arizona. And like you said, the head coach Ken Clusberry, he he just he he's been on the road. I mean, even when Kyler Murray was out, you still finding ways to win the ball game. What court McCoy went? Three for one? He went three yes. and one? Yes, time? when when uh when Kyler Murray was out. And I'm yeah. happy you mentioned Pittsburgh's very own James Conner. Put that man in the Pro Bowl this year with how he's played 100%. this season. 100%. I agree with you. Ike, this is always the best. We'll be back on Monday recapping week 14, even though the Steelers don't play, having played on Thursday night. But in week 15, the Steelers will go up against the Tennessee Titans, still trying to keep their playoff hopes alive. It's hanging on by just a sliver. But I'm going to give a shout out to you, Ike Taylor. To the Believe Podcast Network, the folks over at Brinks TV, led by John Brinkus, Courtney Vargas, Herbert Diaz, and the crew over there. Today's sponsors of the Believe in Steelers podcast, Bet Online and Lightbox. And I also want to thank the viewers and the listeners of the Believe in Steelers podcast. Thank you for tuning in. Peace.